Hello, George Maxwell. I'm the author of Agent of Mercy, the untold story of Archibald S. Maxwell, Civil War surgeon and Iowa State sanitary agent. This is the first of, of a series of video presentations that I will do on Civil War medicine and also on Iowa medical assistance that they provided to their soldiers during the Civil War, including politics that are associated with the provision of that medical aid. So if you would like to subscribe to additional videos, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And also please put your likes and your comments below. I will read every comment and try to respond to it or incorporate it in future videos. Without further ado, this is the first in a series of videos where we'll explore the topic of Civil War medicine for the early part of the Civil War and medical aid provided to Iowa soldiers in the Union, as well as the political winds that surrounded providing this aid during the Governor Kirkwood period Governor Kirkwood was governor of, of Iowa during the start at the beginning of the Civil War, 1861, 62, and 63. And as part of the discussion of the politics, we will discuss uh, the emergence of different leaders uh, that sought and contested for control of this uh, movement, the movement which it was basically to collect medical aid and distribute it to Iowa soldiers. Um, early leaders of different parts of the movement, you had one faction led by Reverend Kynett, another faction led by Annie Whitmire, and another prominent leader was Ann Harlan, Senator James Harlan's wife. Um, these different contending parties had substantive differences about how to gather aid and also how to distribute it. And there also were disagreements um, that related to uh, the inability of some of the men in particular to accept the emergence of women as leaders in, in, in this more, uh, in a more public uh, sphere um, uh, and and so that's kind of uh, will, will be discussed as, as part of this series. But our series will follow in detail an ally and supporter of Annie Whitmire, Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell. Why? Well, because Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell served in a number of different roles. He was a doctor and a surgeon. Um, and as a surgeon, he also um, was a volunteer first, and then a contract surgeon, and then an assistant surgeon of volunteers. And finally, he would serve as an Iowa State sanitary agent alongside Annie Whitmire. Annie Whitmire was the first Iowa State sanitary agent appointed uh, under uh, Iowa statute, and the first women, I believe, to have served as an official um, state uh, appointee. Uh, because of the various roles that Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell played, his role as an ally of Annie Whitmire, we can discuss Civil War medicine on the Western Front, organizing and volunteer efforts in the Civil War, the rise of women leaders in Iowa Civil War medicine politics, and, and the reaction to their rise. I invite you to join me on this, uh, join me as we launch on this adventure. This first video will explore Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell, who he was and how and how and why he became a doctor. It will also discuss Civil War medicine and standard medical practice at the time. Dr. Archibald Stevens Maxwell was born on June 23, 1818 in Tuscarawas County, Ohio. He is my three greats grandfather. He was the 10th of 11 children of John and Ruth Sifford. John and Ruth were farmers who had originally left the Gettysburg area of Pennsylvania to move to the Ohio frontier in the early 1800s. His father, John, died when Archibald was four years old in 1822. 
Shortly after John's death, the family moved to a farm in the Berlin Township, Ohio area. Uh, Archibald would eventually marry Charlotte Hoff, and they had five children that lived to adult, adulthood. John, Marie, Marietta, Samuel, and George. George is my two greats grandfather. Dr. Archibald spent the majority of, of his professional career as a doctor in the Davenport, Iowa area. At the end of his life, he moved to Los Angeles, California due to uh, a health issue. He had a lung ailment that had been bothering him for many, many years. He died shortly after his move in March 13, 1884, and was eventually buried in Davenport, Iowa. So Archibald's first profession was a newspaperman. As I mentioned, he was the 10th uh, of 11 children. Uh, there are many boys in, in, in front of him who presumably were going to farm the family farm. And so he realized that his best way wa forward was to get an education and have a profession. And um, the first profession he decided to try his hand at was as a printer. And he took a job at age 16 with uh, a brand new newspaper that was being founded in Finley, Ohio called the Finley Courier. It was a Democratic Party newspaper, which is to say that the Democratic Party supported it and that it supported uh, the Democratic candidate for president in 1836, which was Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren, if you recall, uh, was the president that followed Andrew Jackson. The Democratic Party at the po that point in time uh, was uh, very much uh, anti-national bank, as Andrew Jackson had managed to eliminate um, the bank that, that Alexander Hamilton had founded, the first national bank of the United States. Uh, that was their uh, big rallying cry, and they were perceived to be pro-Western uh, settlement and, and, and supposedly, you know, fought for the little guy um, against elite uh, moneyed interests uh, on the East Coast. Um, the uh, Findlay Courier uh, didn't last long. By November of 1837, it went out of business. Um, Archibald did not want to go home at that point in time. He wanted to continue his work as a newspaperman, and he didn't have a lot of options according to his biography. Uh, and, and the only real option that he had was to uh, take a job with the Hancock Republican, which was a Whig party paper. Uh, he, in his biography, he made very clear that at the time he didn't consider himself a Whig, but he was extremely appreciative of the um, the editor who took time to uh, further uh, Archibald's education and provided him with a job uh, uh, until, of course, he decided to leave in uh, 1839, was a co-founder of the Shield and Banner in Mansfield, Ohio. Um, a uh, little snippet from that newspaper is is here on the screen next to me. Um, and it was a newspaper that he would run for about three years, from age 21 to age 23. Um, and it was also a Democratic newspaper. Um, and they were kind of the Democratic Party mouthpiece for the Mansfield, Ohio area. So Archibald decided that he would sell his business to fund his education and his next professional career pursuit, which was at the time to become a lawyer. He would then eventually become a doctor for reasons I'll explain later. Um, when he and his partner decided to sell, they um, ran the ad that appears on this, uh, on this slide in the newspaper. And uh, I, I wanted to point out this ad because it does a number of different things. First, 
it kind of explains and is a metaphor for how different things are today than they were pre-Civil War business-wise. Um, and and, and that, that also is kind of a metaphor for how different medicine is today from what was pre-Civil War. So um, what this ad essentially says is that they could not do what was normally custom when collecting debts from other people, which was to call on the person who owed you money. They were, they apologized for that because their subscribers were uh, throughout Mansfield and it was not physically possible. Um, instead, what they, what they did was they created an incentive to pay them and repay the debt that was owed to them uh, before the business closed and they sold the business to another editor. Uh, if you paid before they closed the business, you could pay them in either wheat or money. Um, after the business closed, they would only accept money. And this was a clear incentive for everyone who owed them money to pay before the business was closed and sold. Uh, the reason was a lot of farmers had wheat, they had produce, uh, they didn't have a lot of money. Money was scarce. Um, money was scarce for a lot of different reasons. One of them because the National Bank had closed and so there was less money in circulation um, and it, money was hard to come by. Um, and so being able to pay in produce was, was uh, one way to settle one's debts um, and there was an advantage to that. Uh, that's in, grass, in great contrast to today. Uh, you can't go to the grocery store and pay for your bill in wheat or some other form of produce. Um, that's just not how business is done in, today. Um, having collected all of the money that was owed them and from the sale, he then took his half of the money and he went and entered Ashland Academy, which was a finishing school, equivalent to more or less like kind of like a high school or a prep school before going to college. And he would graduate from the prep school and start hit to pursue his career as a lawyer when he got sick. Pretty gravely ill as a matter of fact, and um, ended up having to return home to be nursed back to health. And as a result of that illness, he lost his voice. Uh, lawyers back then, uh, there were no microphones, and so you had to have a voice that could project. And uh, after this illness, his he no longer could project uh, his voice anymore. And so he decided instead to pursue a career in medicine. Um, the standard practice back then in medicine was to apprentice yourself to a, a medical doctor for a term of years. The emerging practice at the time was, uh, not everyone did this, some people just apprenticed. But what the emerging practice was, was to go and get a two-year education and do a five years uh, practicum with a uh, preceptor. That was the name of your doctor that you apprenticed with. So uh, Archibald enrolled in Western College in a two-year program, graduated in 1848. And he apprenticed to the local doctor in Berlin, Ohio, and uh, would graduate when he graduated in 48, he married that doctor's stepdaughter, Charlotte Hoff. Um, when 
they went into practice. He went into practice then with his father-in-law uh, in the Berlin, Ohio area, and he rode circuit. What does that mean? Which we, it meant that he would get calls and he'd ride out at any time of day uh, across the wide area around Berlin, Ohio, to wherever whosoever home was sick. He also uh, developed a, a, a practice as a surgeon and would be go out on calls to do surgeries. Um, and th in, this, in, in this way, he was different than, than other practicing doctors who uh, not very, very many of them did surgeries. Largely, I suspect, because the results were not good. I mean, you didn't have antibiotics and a lot of people died of infections. And also they weren't as skilled with anatomy and surgery as um, they would become after the Civil War. But he uh, gained a reputation as a skilled surgeon in, the, in that area. Um, but the, his, lung, his lungs began to bother him being out in the cold and the wet riding around on a horse and so he decided in 1855 that he would move to Davenport, Iowa, uh, which was on the, uh, on the frontier. It was a frontier town um, where property, uh, property prices were, were rising rapidly, but it was a town. So he could settle in and potentially um, have a more uh, settled practice where he wasn't riding circuit. Um, and so that's why he moves to Davenport in a April 1855 to set up a, 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 a more settled practice uh, and invest his money in real estate and, and with the hopes that he would be able to uh, live somewhat off rent and, and, and off this smaller practice. So doc, Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell's practice in Davenport evolved over time. The first ad uh, that appears in the center here is from uh, December 29th, 1855, when he arrived in town. Uh, he was focusing specifically on certain surgeries. He has his list of recommendations there, um, which was not unusual when you were a new doctor in town. It was standard to provide recommendations. Um, and he was, uh, his key intention was to focus on certain surgeries and attempt to live off rents from the, his real estate investments. Uh, however, there was a financial crisis in 1857 uh, in which he lost most of that property. And that caused him to change the type of, of practice that he had and uh, the February 1862, uh, where he's in the general practice of medicine out of an office on Brady Street what, in Davenport was uh, what was what he, it evolved to. He could, he still did a lot of surgeries, focused on those, but he needed to have a general practice um, in order to uh, pay his bills and, and, and make his money. He would be in general practice basically for the rest of uh, his uh, professional career. Um, and um, he did have one stint uh, where he taught, uh, this is during the Civil War from uh, October of 1862 to May of 1863 in Keokuk, Iowa. Uh, as part of the College of Physicians and Surgeons there, where he taught physiology and pathology, which was something he always wanted to do. He wanted to give back to the profession. Um, and uh, basically, he's in this general practice uh, as a general, uh, general practice doctor in Davenport when uh, the Civil War starts, and he's been in town long enough uh, and, and was one of the founding members of, of, of the local uh, physicians uh, society um, for the local area and w was somewhat well known for being a good doctor. The medicine of Dr. Archibald's day is not really recognizable 
today in, in, in many forms. And we'll, we'll get into the details of that just now. Um, doctors pre-Civil War and during the Civil War could diagnose, they, they could diagnose what the communi various communicable, communicable diseases. So they could tell you what you were sick with and what might likely kill you. Um, but they didn't have really effective methods of treatment for most of it. Um, and they also didn't know how you got sick. Uh, they, general practicing doctors did not recognize the importance or the, even the existence of bacteria or viruses as vectors for infection and disease. And when you recognize that, then you realize, well, that means they didn't know that they had to sterilize their equipment and they didn't. Um, they didn't know that sharing one sponge uh, among the various uh, wounded guys in one ward would lead to the transmission of, of, um, of one infection or another to the whole ward. Um, with the exception of smallpox, which they had developed a regimen for inoculation, they really didn't have good treatments um, for, for most of these infectious diseases. And the theories about how disease was spread uh, mm -hmm. also is... Um, well, they, they thought that disease was spread based on bad air or um, uh, lack of light, uh, bad nutrition, which was in part, the, the nutrition thing was actually part, uh, that, that was an observation that was prescient um, uh, because nutrition issues did plague the Union Army. Um, and um also they thought that the place where you camped uh, mattered so if you camped on high ground that was better than camping on low ground they didn't connect the camping on the low ground to being not great for your health uh to the fact that soldiers would commonly drink uh swampy water full of bacteria which caused them to get dysentery um, they instead, you know, connected the place to the infection, not necessarily the bacteria in, in the water that, that, that you drank. Um, and most of medicine and how they treated you for your various infections and diseases was based on medicine modeled by Dr. Benjamin Rush the famous Revolutionary War doctor. And this, the, the various theories they had for how to treat infections and diseases was they were going to do things that caused your body to purge the disease. Um, so as part of that theory, they would bleed their patients uh, or um, give them uh, things that cause the production of excessive saliva or vomiting or an enema. Um, and many of the things that they gave were actually poisons of some sort, which caused your body to react in that way. And many of the drugs were laced with addictive opium, which was used to treat pain, but it also led to many addicted soldiers. Um, one thing doctors could do on injured soldiers is they could perform surgeries. They weren't particularly practiced and skilled at most, most of the doctors weren't practiced and skilled at it because they hadn't had a lot of opportunities. Um, and, but uh, they, before the Civil War, but um, they could perform surgeries and they could perform them under uh, a very primitive form of anesthesia. So you, so in many cases, um, the soldier was unconscious for the surgery. Uh, but risks of infection were high. In fact, 
they thought infection was part of the normal healing process for how the body healed itself. And it was pretty unusual. Uh, there were a couple of cases during the Civil War where individuals didn't get infected and they thought that there was something actually wrong with them and they studied them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Archibald was, a, was an experienced surgeon and, and in many cases that made him somewhat uh, more unique and unusual from most doctors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, most doctors didn't do surgeries because uh, infections were high uh, and led to suboptimal results. Um, the, uh, the thing is, is if you'd have asked the doctors at the time, they probably would have said that they thought that they were doing a, a good job. Um, and that's because by comparison to the last war, they were doing a much better job. The last major war was the US-Mexico War of 1848. And as George Worthington Adams mentions in, Doctor, in his book, Doctors in Blue, in the US-Mexico War, 10 men died of disease for every one killed in action on the battlefield. That's astoundingly high as a ratio. In the Civil War, that fell to one out of three. A lot better. Of course, the problem, the Civil War involved hundreds of thousands of men, a lot more than the U.S.-Mexico War. Um, and so uh, the scale of the, the action and, and, the, and, and, and those killed and those who fell, uh, got sick, and died of disease was significantly greater. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, battlefield injuries and, um, and the size of the battles were larger during the Civil War is that there had been a number of technological improvements that made this possible. You had improvements in transportation with trains and steam powered ships this allowed logistics to support a larger number of troops in the field uh, so they could fight larger battles. Uh, in addition, another, an, another invention, and there were a lot of them, but I'll just point out one here, the mini ball, uh, which was invented by a French officer mini. It's not really a ball. It's more of a conical shaped uh, bullet, a conical shaped bullet with a hollow, uh, hollow point at the, at the base of the bullet, it basically uh, permitted the, the, the use of, of, of mass amounts of rifles because what happened when the mini ball was fired is that the hollow base then spread, went into the rifling and, and, and made an efficient uh, use of, uh, you could, because you could fast reload rifles. This improved the accuracy and the distance and the mini ball also flew a lot faster than your old standard round round shot, which was largely inaccurate and, and, and didn't fly as fast. Because it flew faster and it also was less stable than a round, a round shot, it sometimes broke apart or when it hit, uh, in, or, or, or when it hit the body, hit a bone, for instance, the bone would shatter because it was going at such a uh, high speed, um, or it would the bullet would, bullet would disintegrate. And this, um, these things, the larger battles and the, and, the, and, and the more complex injuries and the more injuries basically swamped the unprepared medical system early in the Civil War, which wasn't designed to treat that many casualties. Um, and it led to the wounded waiting for days in, in basically um, unsanitary conditions. Uh, and this led to more infections and amputations. The faster mini ball led to shattered bones and they had no way to put shattered bones back together. There were some attempts to try that at the beginning of the war that really, um, uh, did not go well, uh, and um, 
And it wasn't until the head surgeon of the Army of the Potomac, Dr. Leatherman, came up with a, uh, a, a much better, more efficient system, which is very similar to the one that, that the Army still uses today, which uses professional trained medics to evacuate people to a mass style hospital for treatment and then on to another hospital. And Dr. Leatherman doesn't doesn't become doesn't take over the head of, as head surgeon of the Army of the Potomac until um, at the the end of the uh, Peninsular campaign. So um, so you know for the early part of the Civil War things were pretty haphazard, and the system just didn't work well. Um, but uh, that those were the growing pains, and we'll get we'll get into them um, in more detail in 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 other parts of the series. So medical instruments, some of these would have been in Dr. Arch, were Dr. Archibald's uh, and some of them are, were not. Uh, you can see these at the Putnam Museum in Davenport, Iowa. Um, the, I will take them from the top and, and go and work my way down. Um, top one is called a tokar, it's used for draining cysts. So once again, um, it, 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 some people just actually had cysts, but also a common thing, remember we're back into the purging the bad stuff out of you phase, right? So one of the things they would do is they would use a hot cup to cause a cyst to form and then drain the cyst with the idea that by draining uh, the fluid from the cyst that somehow they were draining the thing that was causing you to be sick. Um, the next uh, item down is um, a cylindrical trapeze saw. So a trapeze saw was used mainly with head injuries. It was used to drill a hole in your head. So if you had a brain, you had a brain injury causing brain swelling or you, your, the skull had been cracked and they needed to get the broken piece of skull off of your brain, um, they might use the trapeze saw to drill a hole in order to be able to remove that chunk of bone. And there were soldiers that did survive that surgery. Um, the two items down uh, just below the, the, the fraying belt there are um, amputation knives, self-explanatory. They were used to amputate limbs um, in, in surgery. Uh, the fourth item down there is called a bullet scoop. We use to scoop bullet fragments or bullets or uh, shrapnel uh, out, of, out of wounds. Um, and then there's the steel elevator for removing bone during trepaning. So when you're trepaning, you'd need to be able to somehow lever up the chunk of skull. That's uh, the, what they would use. And then bullet forceps. So used to get in there and in the wound injury and grab a hold of this uh, piece of shrapnel or piece of bullet or bullet that was lodged in, in the body. Um, so that, and, and one item that's obviously missing is the bone saw. We're not exactly sure what happened to Dr. Archibald's bone saw. Um, he did have one, um, but uh, yes, so um, a bone saw would also be something that, that they would, that, that was commonly in the doctor bag. Now we'll discuss the various ways that people served and the various a aspects that people served in the Civil War, um, providing medical aid. And you'll hear about these throughout our future presentations, so it's a good idea to get these out of the way. Dr. Archibald Maxwell um, served in, in all of these various roles. Uh, so, there were volunteer civil surgeons and doctors, particularly at the beginning uh, of, of the war. Um, there was, we'll, we'll discuss how that was curtailed later on, but volunteer civil surgeons and doctors, they were people who would 
uh, get a pass from the general and go and show up at the front to provide medical care because there just weren't enough people there to provide it. There are also volunteer nurses and, and nurses that also signed up to serve during the, the, the Civil War. Many women, women did that. There were also women doctors. Um, there were, were what was called regular Army Medical Corps surgeons and assistant surgeons. These were uh, regular Army. So they, many of them were part of the original Medical Corps at the beginning of the Civil War, which as we'll discuss later on, was uh, at the very beginning of the Civil War, somewhat uh, uh, rigid and, and, and time bound and, and kind of unable to deliver at least the beginning of the war, the medical aid that was required, particularly in the quantity. Um, and then there were uh, US regimental surgeons and assistant surgeons of volunteers volunteer the volunteers mo, uh, being particularly important so as each regiment in a state was raised that regiment would get a, a volunteers and these volunteers were for various terms of service during the civil war the first term obviously uh were the were the 90 day soldiers during the first call up in iowa that was uh, the first regiment and then uh, later regiments were raised for uh, other periods of time. Um, and, but each of these regiments had a surgeon and an assistant surgeon, or at least they were supposed to, okay? Um, and, but what happened was is these surgeons, some of them went AWOL, absent without leave, walked off, or they quit. Um, some of them would consume the medicinal alcohol uh, and were uh, became alcoholics and unable to provide their form their duties. And so, what what would happen if a regiment found itself without a surgeon? The colonel uh, or commanding officer could sign a contract with a surgeon or assistant surgeon to provide medical services for a period of time based on the contract. It was not, uh, if you had a contract, you were just the doctor who was contracted to provide these services. It wasn't the same as being a, an appointed US regimental surgeon and assistant surgeon, which came with military rank and military pay. Um, so Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell, as we'll, we'll get into it, first started off as a volunteer, then became a contract regimental surgeon, and was finally appointed a U.S. assistant surgeon of volunteers. Um, and that he held that position for a good chunk of his Civil War service before he became an Iowa State sanitary agent. As promised, I'm providing a reading list of additional books if you uh, want to uh, study further uh, Civil War medicine and uh, some of the other topics such as newspapers uh, that were uh, covered in today's um, video discussion. Uh, the first one on the top, Doctors in Blue by George Worthington Adams. It's an absolute must read for anyone who's interested in getting a good leap, uh, a good start on, on, on uh, Civil War medicine. Um, he also has uh, Doctors in Gray as well. Um, uh, other uh, medicine and medical aid uh, related books. Uh, my book, a Agent of Mercy, The Untold Story of Dr. Archibald S. Maxwell, Civil War Surgeon and Iowa State Sanitary Agent, is, as uh, I have discussed, a, a good topical discussion of, of these various areas of Civil War medicine and also the provision of medical aid, particularly to Iowa soldiers by Iowans uh, and the politics that, that went into that. And, and we will cover all these various areas in, in upcoming video series. 
Um, Scott McGaws, Surgeon in Blue, Jonathan Letterman, the Civil War doctor who pioneered battlefield care. Absolutely great book. Um, it talks about um, Jonathan Letterman, who was uh, the lead surgeon for uh, the Army of the Potomac for a period of time during the Civil War. And he came up with the battlefield care uh, uh, system that in many cases we still use. Um, and so it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great book, talks about what preceded it, preceded that, that, that system, and then the development of the system uh, by Jonathan Letterman and, and how he implemented it. Um, Ira Rutkow's Bleeding Blue and Gray, Civil War Surgery and the Evolution of American Medicine is also um, a wonderful book, highly recommend it. Um, and then if you're interested in uh, the profile of uh, a newspaper man, a politician, and the first Secretary of War um, uh, under Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, uh, amiable, Paul Cahan's Amiable Scoundrel uh, uh, is an excellent read. Um, it discusses both um, the, the newspaper aspects of the rise of Simon Cameron and um, also his, uh, his political, the political career and his service as Secretary of War and then afterwards. So uh, it's an excellent book, highly recommend it. I uh, recommend all these books. And at, at the end of each video series, I will provide a recommended reading list if you're interested in more, learning more about each of these topics. So that's all for this week. Next week, we're going to discuss uh, sanitary commissions and the efforts of the citizens of Davenport to, to provide volunteer service, why they thought it was necessary to send medical aid and volunteer surgeons to and, and nurses um, to provide uh, help and assistance after the Battle of Fort Donelson.